Notebook on Cities and Culture's Korea Tour is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, David Hayes, and Polar Inertia Journal, an outlet for artists and researchers documenting the urban condition at polarinertia.com. You've lived in a great many countries. Tell me, which was the country where you became vegan? Um, I would say it was here in Korea because I moved to Korea in 2006, end of 2006, and around that time, um, I kind of like started getting interested in becoming vegetarian, and so then I was just like, yeah, I was doing the vegetarian thing for a while, and then around like two years later, I was like, okay, I'm gonna become vegan, so I made the official leap. But that was that all that transition all happened within Korea. One of the least likely countries, to my mind, for that to happen, yeah. isn't it? Um, it was all just because I was researching. Like, well, at first, I would say I went vegetarian because I, for more for environmental reasons, and I wanted to reduce my carbon footprint and everything. Mm -hmm. So that's the main reason why I stopped eating meat. But then, like, the more that I researched. Like animal farming and all the cruelty that goes into it, um, like I couldn't, you know, I ran out of excuses <laughs> to go vegan. So then, like, it was a gradual process, though, um, and I kind of always knew that I would eventually become vegan. Um, but yeah, it's kind of crazy that it happened in Korea. I think I was just more open to everything during that time, during that whole like transition of moving to Korea, and yeah. And it is here in Korea, in Seoul, specifically Gangnam, that on Notebook on Cities and Culture today, I'm speaking with Mipa Lee, who is several things. She is an artist, she's a blogger, the blogger behind Aliens Day Out, about the exploration of Seoul and the vegan eating therein, and above all, the proprietor of Plant in Itaewon, a vegan, vegetarian bakery and cafe. I've heard so much that, I've heard so often that the Koreans are both the most and least health conscious people in the world. Is that true? The most and worst. Most and least, like simultaneously most into their health and also possessed of some of the worst eating and smoking and drinking habits. Yeah, I don't know what that is about. I think Koreans, yeah, they want to be healthy, but then, I don't know, there's like this repressed like unhealthiness that just like comes out and then, um, yeah, Koreans are very... They have a very like addictive personality where they can you know go one way or the other and these two extremes. Mm. Um, I don't know. Koreans need to work on the balance thing. I think. <laughs> so after being born here, what other places you've lived? What's been your pathway through the world, starting in Korea, ending up at the present moment for now anyway in Korea? I was born in Korea in Busan to be exact, and then before I was like before I was a year old. Uh, my parents moved to England, like our whole family moved to England. Um, so we were there for about four years and um, my parents were missionaries and so they were doing their missions training in England and then after that we moved to Ghana in West Africa and we were there for about 10 years um, until I was 14 and I went to boarding school in Ivory Coast and then lived in Ghana and, um, and then after that we came back to Korea um, and we lived in Daejeon, which is like south of Seoul. Um, and then there I went to like international school, which was an all American based. And so I, I graduated uh, high school there and then went to the States for college in like Pennsylvania. And then after graduation, lived in LA for a bit. And then um, visa expired. So I had to come back to Korea in like late 2006. And I've pretty much been in Korea since then. I mean, I've been. I've traveled and like visited the U.S. and stuff since then, but like living-wise, <laughs> I've been in Korea since then, yeah. So the whole time you were growing up, I mean, did you live with the expectation like, I'm going to be wherever I am temporarily and we'll be moving on soon, so don't put down roots that are too deep? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Um, even now, even like after I moved back to Korea, I've always been <laughs> like expecting that I'm going to leave Korea. Um, and I never, it took me a long time to like buy furniture. <laughs> right. I was like, I don't know how long I'm going to stay here. I'm going to leave soon. I don't want to like put down roots. But now that I have a shop here, I'm definitely more rooted. And I know that I at least have to be here for another like two, two, three years, I'm thinking. Um, but I am like in the back of my head, always planning my escape, you know, <laughs> like where else am I going to go? It's always an escape hatch. I think I have that like restlessness, like right. since childhood, because I have moved around a lot. Mm. So... Do your parents continue to move around? Uh, now my parents are in Korea. Like since Ghana, 
Um, we've pretty much been living in Korea with maybe like a short stint in like the U the UK, but um, now they're living here. Yeah. So, are you? Would you describe your parents as sort of like early international Koreans? Yeah, I would. Um, one of like the pioneers, kind of of like. Could they leave before it was officially allowed for everybody to leave, like because of being missionaries? Or? No, I think they were. I think at that time, yeah, people were allowed to to go abroad, but. Um, but, yeah, they just took that leap and, like, went to Ghana, of all places, yeah. Right, it does seem, I mean, you say, like, Ghana, going South Korea to Ghana seems like the most foreign place you could possibly go. But is there a sense in which, coming from Korea in that era, I mean, your parents' generation, every place is pretty foreign because of how closed Korea had been? Like, yeah, the States, Ghana, Australia, whatever, it's all kind of, it's all the Uyghurk. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, um... I don't, know, I don't know how they did it. Like, I, when I think back, it must have taken so much courage and bravery to do something like that and to, to pick up your whole family up and move to another country where there are no other Koreans. Right. Um, and then to have to learn language there and, you know, figure out life. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what do you, what, oh, hey. <laughs> what, do you, what do you remember from the process of figuring out life there in Ghana? The, um, I don't know. I think I was kind of sheltered from that. Like I didn't have to deal with it as much as a kid. Um, I didn't. I never really saw my parents struggling to to live there. It was just, yeah, just it was all okay. Like. Do they say now? Oh, it was so hard. Um, not really. Yeah. I think they they enjoyed life there and the simplicity of it and. Um, like they, I think maybe the hardest thing was this food, like missing Korean food, and um, yeah, like maybe the heat. <laughs> sure, all those things. The name of your blog, Aliens Day Out, comes from your days in Ivory Coast boarding school, right? right. What's the story behind that? Uh, the story is I went to boarding school in Ivory Coast, and then my parents, well, my parents, we lived in Ghana, and so, and in boarding school, um, every term the kids could have one weekend where their parents would come and take their kids out for like a weekend or a day out. Um, but then for the kids whose parents were outside of Ivory Coast, they, it was too far for them to come and like um, see their kids. So then for those kids, um, we were called aliens because first of all, yeah, we weren't, our families weren't living in, in Ivory Coast. Um, so then the dorm parents would take us out just for one day and we would go to like the pool sure. and like a restaurant or something and just do something fun. And so f that, that day was called Aliens Day Out. Right. Um, and I, it just like stuck with me. And so when I came to Korea, like as a vegan and as a like not fully Korean Korean person, I felt like an alien. But then I wanted to, you know, I want to also enjoy being in Korea and have like, you know, be able to enjoy food here and not feel so alien at the same time so you know i wanted to say you know people who are foreigners or different they can still come to korea and enjoy and have a day out and yeah right. it's good to hear that i mean because i want to get a sense of how much distance you feel from you know korean koreans as you say me being here and i'll probably live in korea in the future it's so like it's so obvious that i'm not i don't really count in society you know what i mean which is okay if you can work with that and enjoy that, and there's a lot to be enjoyed about that. Cool. Foreigners who don't, who really want to be Korean, have a little more of a struggle. What, it, what? How much? How close or far apart do you feel from just the general public in Korea? Considering when they see you, they think Korean, and when they talk to you, they unless you say you you grew up somewhere else, I mean, they won't really know where you've been. So, what do you do? You, how foreign do you consider yourself, or do you actually feel? I think I do consider myself pretty foreign here still, even after eight years of living here. I mean, it's definitely, I definitely do feel more comfortable living in Korea, and um, I understand Koreans more than I did before, but um, just in general, I still feel pretty foreign. Uh, my, my Korean is still pretty bad, um, although, oh, it, <laughs> although it has improved a lot since I started the business, but... Um, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, like I, like all of my friends are English speakers here, and um, I don't have many Korean Korean friends. And the Korean Koreans that I do meet, they're more like customers who come to the shop, and so that's the kind of interaction that I have with locals. And so um, I still feel pretty different um, and kind of like an outsider. 
but um, yeah, I would say that I'm like assimilating more. Yeah. There, there is a sense in which plant is kind of international waters, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, you see pictures on the blog, and when I've looked at it, it's always. I'm not saying it's. I don't see any Koreans in these pictures, but it's like all over. The people from all over, like the whole world, is sort of there. Maybe Korea is disproportionately less represented, but it's people from all over. Uh -huh. is, is that a reason you chose to open the cafe in Itaewon? I mean, what role does Itaewon play in, in Seoul in terms of internationalism? It is a very important reason why um, I chose Itaewon. Well, at first we were looking around like Hongdae area because it's so it's also pretty international. It's international, but not as much as Itaewon for sure. But it's more like the youth crowd, mm -hmm. and so we're like, okay, young people might be more interested in veganism. But um, there are less foreigners there, and I don't know. We just kind of lucked out on finding a space in Itaewon. Mm -hmm. um, I was kind of hesitant about move, uh, opening a shop in Itaewon just because it was far from my house. But in the end, it, I think it really is the best place for a vegan vegetarian cafe to be because of the foreigners that live there and just the type of people. I think they understand, even if they're not vegan or vegetarian, they're just more interested in healthy eating, more um, more like California-style food. Sure, more <laughs> um, <aware. laughs> uh -huh. and, and just because it's more comfortable for me also, honestly, just to, you know, have foreign customers and Itaewon is a very happening spot in Korea, in Seoul now. It's kind of turned into the new neighborhood to go to and it's funny because now it's kind of like a tourist space, yeah. tourist place for Koreans yeah. to come and so it's like the, the rest of the world in Korea that they can visit. Exactly and so they come and check out all these foreign owned restaurants and um, <laughs> it's really interesting how that transition has happened over the past few years whereas before it was so it's all. It was mostly foreigners on the street, but now you see a lot more like young Koreans coming in, and they're like curious and checking everything out. It's so. an interesting inversion of. I mean, I live in Koreatown in Los Angeles, which is Korea amid Los Angeles, which is like the whole world in kind of city form. And then Itaewon is the whole world in a neighborhood yeah. among Korea. That's. I guess it's exactly the reverse, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And there, what's great is that like there, the neighborhoods that are around Itaewon. Um, like more foreigners live there as well and so it feels like this weird <laughs> foreign community and all, a lot of my my regulars are pretty much all foreigners just because they live close and they can stop by and you know and yeah it's like building this little community wow. and so it's astonishing when i mean i read all the korean history i can especially the history of seoul and you look at how itaewon was even in mm -hmm. 1980 or 1990 and it sounded like a dump. I mean, to be honest, uh, well, where it was up, even up to a few years, a few yeah, years ago. But now it's the now it's the logical place for a vegan bakery and cafe. Like that's a night and day change. When did that happen? When did it happen? I don't know. I mean, I think we still are the only vegan vegetarian place in Itaewon, right. and um, Itaewon. There's not a whole lot of other options for vegans vegetarians, but. Um, just the international vibes of Itaewon allow that to happen and kind of like help it to grow. Yeah. So how did it feel when you first returned to Korea in 2006? Like, were you, was this just a place to stop off for a bit before you could plan your next move? Or were you thinking, well, let's see how this goes? Mm -hmm. Well, I came to Korea kind of against my own will. Um, I, I, my visa expired in the U.S. and so I had to come back to Korea, but... Um, and I, I didn't think I was going to stay for more than a year or two because I really, I couldn't see myself living here. And I didn't want to do the whole English teacher thing. Um, and like, I, I'm not like a teacher kind of person. Um, so I was always wanting to go out, like get out, whether it was going to back to the U.S. or anywhere else, really. I just wanted to leave Korea. Um, and it was difficult coming back because I didn't, feel like I belonged here at all and I get I, none of my friends were here um, I didn't really know anybody but then yeah I mean now it's been like eight years and I'm still here <laughs> right. that, that initial feeling of isolation is that why you were just doing so much baking at home at that time oh no at that time I wasn't doing baking at all like uh, when did I, you start baking um well I w when I moved back to Korea I started working for an English hagwon, but I wasn't teaching in the classroom. I was editing students' English essays online. And so there was a lot of like 
freedom and I was able to work from home. So around that time, I, you know, I made the transition to become vegan. And then there was like no baked, vegan baked goods around Korea or Seoul. And so I had to... You can't go to like Pariba. Exactly. <laughs> so I had to... It'll have a sausage in it, probably. Yeah. <laughs> It'll have like everything in it. <laughs> um, so I had to bake for myself. And I, I didn't know anything about vegan baking. And it was just like a lot of just learning, trial and error, and just doing it for fun. And around that same time, I also started the Alien Stay Out blog. And it was just like documenting my life as a vegan in Korea. And like, oh, you know, where I, where I went to eat. And um, eventually I would post recipes. Piece of whatever I baked and pictures and stuff and then um, and then I you know, kind of grew this following on my blog and um, and then I did random like bake sales like bake sale fundraisers for the Animal Rescue Korea organization in, in, in like how to say how to put it in re real life or on the internet or how did it work oh it was in real, in real, yeah, at, like at a location, and people would come. It was maybe like once or twice a year, not that often, um, but people would come and they would, you know, buy and they'd say, you know, you should open a, your own shop, or I would totally buy this. Um, and so then I opened the online website, and then I would take orders and do deliveries. So I was doing that for two, two years, two and a half years, um, and that baking. Seems like for an only house. in Korea type thing you can do, like running a bake shop where you can deliver to the whole of the country, right? Same day and everything? Yeah, all over Korea. Um, the delivery system is so fast here that... They, is it just because the country is small or what's what's small. going on? I think so, and they're also very efficient. <laughs> that, yeah, so... Like somebody in Busan orders, which is as far as you get essentially from Seoul, orders, I don't know, cupcakes mm -hmm. in the morning. You know, when would they have, when would they have received them? Well, if I had a delivery out um, on one day, it'll be delivered the next day. So it's pretty fast, like considering. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, very fast. So that yeah, that definitely allowed me to do the online online shop. So I, I, yeah, I was baking from my house um, for a long time, and you know, just cranking out yeah. and stuff. Right. And then eventually, I I knew I needed a studio kitchen outside of my house. Right. Um, you can't be living in your actual bakery exactly. all the time. There was no there was no separation between work life and my personal space so uh, it was kind of like driving me crazy so I knew I needed to eventually open like what uh, at first I just wanted a studio kitchen just not not a shop at all and then somehow it turned into a cafe restaurant and right. how did that happen what, what, what is that somehow um how that happened um, well I met my business, my former business partner, Yona, and she was also baking from her house. And we both were looking for um, studio space, like just kitchen. Um, and we were both selling to like different cafes around Seoul, and so we needed space. Um, and then just through talking and you know looking up all the, our different options, we were like, it was easier to open a restaurant than it was to open um, a studio space where. We kind of had to get like the factory license and all that stuff. The restaurant was easier. It much easier. There was just too much paperwork with um, that with the other option. Mm -hmm. So we were like, okay, let's just open a small cafe, and um, we can do our baking or other stuff on the side. Um, or yeah, the the bakery shop was gonna be just the thing on the side. Right. <laughs> and then somehow, yeah, over time, it turned into a full fledged restaurant cafe, and yeah, mm -hmm. so unexpected. Yeah. The cafe culture of Seoul really impresses me, and I guess of urban Korea in general. Like, there's, there are cafes everywhere, coffee shops everywhere, and the number of cafes, coffee shops around doesn't seem to. It's like it's like they don't detract from each other somehow. Like it's just this vast ecosystem of coffee shops. How how do you go about integrating yourself into that? Like, I guess I'm just putting them all under kind of an umbrella. Like, there's. They're different kinds, of course, mm -hmm. but where does where does plant fit into like the sort of coffee shop world, cafe world of Seoul? How does it fit in? I, I, I don't know exactly. Does it fit in? Or is it so different that it's kind of its own thing? Um, I think it just fits in in the fact that it is a cafe and it's just one of those like new places. Um, but I th I do think it's a bit unique. Um, just in the fact that it's vegan, vegetarian, and that's so rare. But um, but yeah, like there are so many cafes in Seoul, and it's just 
normal to see another one open up and then another one close. The yeah. turnover rate is so high. It really is. It's just kind of one of those things that, you know, Koreans want to do once in their life. And so if they have the funds, they just like open it and give it a shot. And right. um, they yeah. maybe invest like one or two years into it and see how it goes. And then after that, it's done, you know? Mm. Yeah. It's pretty impressive because compared to America, I feel like it's harder to just open a cafe in America because there's this expectation like either you close quickly or you're open for 20 years, yeah. right? There's, it's like our TV shows in America. Either they run forever or end right away. There's this, it, there's, it seems like it's a little bit freer, a little bit looser here. Like it's maybe, maybe there's not as much red tape opening a business or it's just sort of like something anybody can do it's you've i mean you've built up some expertise baking so it's like you it's a legitimate thing but i feel like just somebody who's tired of working at samsung might think to themselves you know what i'll open a coffee shop and it's like totally viable whereas in america that sounds preposterous it's totally true it's so it is easy to open a cafe here um there's not much red tape just as long as you have the money um and you know find the space like just to set it up and um, it's kind of too easy sometimes. <laughs> like people, they, their concept is like so you know not really thought out. But right. it's they just have this idea like oh I wanna I wanna work at a cafe and it'll be so nice like serving coffee to people and you know. Mm. But um, but I think once it's open and they actually have to survive, I think that's a different story. Like whether their product is actually good or yeah. yeah um, yeah, it's, I always hear about like the, the former engineer who opens a restaurant just because they, you know, because they're or like they have they got forced into retirement and like just the standard thing I guess is to open a restaurant. And it's I can't emphasize enough for people who don't have experience of the American eating culture like the story we tell ourselves there is unless you're so committed to your vision of a restaurant, it's so hard and yeah. so impossible, yeah. nearly impossible, literally to succeed that unless it's the one thing in your life that you won't be able to do it. Like I can't. I, it's hard to understand why there's that contrast. I mean, I like it. I like. I guess there's benefits to both. Like in America, you get a lot of places that have been somebody's really put everything into. But at the same time, here you get new cafes all the time, new concepts all the time. Like there's a certain experimentalism here. I mean, is it does it make it more fun as a cafe goer, or as it's a little bit harder for you because you're looking for vegan places? But there's more of like a ferment. I don't know how to put it. Uh. <laughs> I'm not sure either. Um. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a fundamental difference, I guess. Ultimately, it's I don't know whether it's cultural or economic, I think, or I think Koreans just they can kind of they just want to try it, and they kind of have maybe more Koreans have that um, they're not so afraid of risk, or um, they're just. They'll just try it and see how it goes, and it's just one of those things they'll put in this amount of, they'll invest this much and just see what happens. And like, it's so common for like businesses to open and close that it's not that big of a deal to them anymore. Right. And um, it's a contrast, especially to like Japan, where right. if your business goes under, it's like you're tainted with that for life, you know? No, here it's kind of like, okay, what's the next thing? Yeah, we're in this cafe yeah. for a while, no big deal. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. When, when you first opened, what sort of, how many, I mean, it's like I'm describing the UN or something, but how many different nationalities like started coming in as soon as you opened? Oh, pretty much right away. <laughs> um, there was how, like, how, how, how much of a variety started coming in of people from wherever? Um, well, I don't really know where everyone is from all the time, but um, in terms of just like foreigner versus Korean, um, it was pretty much like right away it was more foreigners than Koreans just because my my blog following was always like you know English speakers and so when they when I announced that I was opening a shop definitely the people who came were foreigners um, initially and then grad I think gradually after that more Koreans started finding out about it and they would come but I would say the core base <laughs> support of plant is like foreigners yeah what were some of your initial specialties when you started out, like things that you knew were pretty strong that you were making? In terms of like food or dessert? I guess any of them. I mean, whatever stuff you had a good sense that people were going to enjoy, or at least that you know you really enjoyed. What were some early... I mean, was there that time when it was... Because I feel like, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago, vegan desserts 
were a little bit like they were pretty hit and miss as far as just the quality. The, especially they had like textural problems. When what were some of the early ones you realized? Oh, this this could be this could be a popular item that you were making. That what were some of the first ones to get really like? Yeah, this is this is a saleable thing. Um, I think for me, probably my cakes, mm. like the chocolate cake or carrot cake.、Mm. Um, like my style of baking is definitely more American style, so.、Um, so it's exotic here. Exotic for Korea, yeah, yeah. and so. Those kinds of more comfort foods for foreigners, like things that they grew up on, those are definitely always like bestsellers. I'm gonna then, try that carrot cake myself、yeah. if it's still a going thing. <laughs> yeah,、um, and then in terms of food、um, for vegan options, was the most popular items were always like the veggie burgers and like sandwiches, like tempeh Reuben sandwiches.、Um, let's see. Like burritos, things like that, and then、um, you know sometimes like we would do like pasta or like rice dishes, but those are kind of things that you can find anywhere in Korea, and so for us they weren't you know that big big hits for us.、Uh, you so, needed the exoticism、mm-hmm. in some sense. And for vegan stuff, people want things that they can't get or they can't make themselves, and so things that are that take a lot of work. Um, like like the veggie burgers and like lent like lentil、um, lentil loaf and things like that. Those、mm. are what people really like. They want something different when they come.、Mm. And also, it's funny is that、um, I noticed that they want when they come to the shop, like a vegan shop, they want something indulgent and like. Not not just like a simple salad with、yes. like a few things here and there, but they want to go for the real deal, you know. And so、um, I tried doing the、go、whole. All out. I tried doing the very healthy thing, but I found that people want to really enjoy, like enjoy food, and they want something heavy and heartier when they come to the shop. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me. There's a of a place in Los Angeles. Before we were recording, we talked vegan food in Los Angeles. There's a place in Hollywood called Doomies. I don't know if you've heard of it, but. It's all vegan comfort food. It's、mm-hmm. like fried chicken,、mm-hmm. nachos, and like all this. Just it would seem it's stuff I would pretty much never eat if it were outside a vegan context. I mean, I'm not vegan, but I would eat. I eat the vegan version of the comfort food、yeah. way more often than、oh, the comfort、yeah. food, just、right. because. I mean, it has to be healthier. It, number yeah, one, yeah. and I don't know. Do you keep an eye on what other? Like what vegan places around the world are doing? Like what's sort of what are vegan trends in other countries? Be it America, is that something you watch and see? What can I import to Korea? Yeah, I do for sure. I definitely you know go online and I see what other people are doing. Sometimes I'll look at other cafes' menus online、um, just to get a sense of you know what what I what I could do.、Um, yeah, and there are trends.、Uh, I don't. Sometimes I'll try it out though, but、um, if it doesn't. Like sometimes it doesn't work for here, and especially in terms of like getting ingredients. Like there are a lot of ingredients that are really hard or expensive to get here, and so I'm kind of limited by that in a lot of ways.、Um, so I just kind of like try to work with what I can get and what's around me for the most part. Yeah. Now, what are the conversations like when you're talking to Korean Koreans and they ask you what veganism is or why you would do it? What do you always have to explain? Um. I I think I have to explain what exactly meat is. Like, <laughs> define, yeah, yeah, you have to define meat. I mean, I hear this from people in Japan. I know a, f- a fair few vegetarians in Japan, and it's always like they go to a place, they say no meat, and like the chicken's okay, or wait, but if we chop the meat up small, it's okay. Like, why don't? To us, it seems like laughable, but what is it in that? I assume it's the same in Korea, where it's sort of like the idea of what is and is not meat is a little bit different from what we have in the West. Why is it? Why is it different? Um, I think just the word kogi meat. I think a lot of Koreans to them that just means beef,、uh, but、um, you have to say like dongul, <laughs> like no dongul please. Yeah, yeah, and then you know fish、mm-hmm. and like seafood is not considered meat to them. That's like another category yeah, in their minds. And so if you say I don't eat meat, they think、oh, okay, but you still eat like seafood and all that stuff. So I. I have to. You have to explain exactly the difference between you know vegetarianism and like you know pescatarianism and、right. vegans and all that. They just don't understand the concept. And、um, also, at, like if I'm explaining why I'm vegan,、um, 
they think it's more for health reasons. They don't really understand the ethical reasons behind it. And so, uh, yeah. How much of this? How much of this do you think might just come from the fact that fifty years ago Koreans didn't have enough to eat, and so it's sort of like, well, why would now? Now there's plenty to eat, but if you come from that sort of like background, it's like, well, why wouldn't you eat everything you can eat? You know what I mean? Oh, I don't really know, like what. Why Korea <laughs> has become so meat centric right. now? Um, maybe that's that's probably one of the reasons. I mean, if I grew up in the aftermath of the war and like I was always hungry, I would probably be eating every absolute thing I could too. But now it's sort of like it's Korea's so different in that respect. Like it couldn't be more different, could it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like it's become so hard meat everywhere, <laughs> and there's always like seafood or something inserted into like the soups. And right. also, I think now that. Maybe those now that they're like importing a lot of meats from like Australia and the U.S., it's cheaper, um, and so yeah, I don't know it's more common. And I wonder, you know, kimchi, the national dish. I feel like no Korean, no matter how international they are, wants to go that long without kimchi. But what's the story with is that? Are do some of them have like fish-related ingredients, or what's is kimchi like something that you? that a vegan might get caught out by if they like assume it's vegan but sometimes it's actually technically not uh, most of the red kimchi are not vegan because uh. they add some fish sauce or like um, like this the shrimp paste in oh, it sure. sometimes um, so you really have to <laughs> actually I, I stay away from like vegan uh, like kimchi when I'm eating out just because I'm pretty sure it's not vegan but um, my mom makes vegan kimchi for me so um, I don't have to worry about it too much but yeah what was the kimchi situation in Ghana Ah, uh, my mom tried to make like cab like kimchi with like just cabbage yeah. and that's that to us is kimchi. I, I mean, see. yeah. I but we couldn't get like the, you know, the Chinese cabbage kimchi. Right. Like the radish, yeah. That stuff is hard to make under any circumstances, yeah, right? Like, like oh, do you know how to make kimchi? No, no, I haven't. Um, my mom has tried to teach me several times, but like, it's such an ordeal, like right. buying the Napa cabbages and then like soaking it and all that. So it's just like too much work. Right. I hope at least some somebody. Somebody in our generation picks it up, or robots no, get invented to I make kimchi. Koreans are nervous that, yeah. like, you know, younger generation is not going to continue <laughs> making their own kimchi. Right, but they still want to eat it, so exactly. there's going to be Someone's money to be made to. sooner or later, right? <laughs> Somebody's going to make it. Um, before recording, we mentioned some of the nationalities coming into your shop. There's Americans, there's people from England, there's South African. I mean, are there any particularly unexpected uh, types of people that have come in? Unexpected, um, or is it, or do you expect every type of person to, to come in? I don't. Yeah, I don't really have any expectation. Um, I mean, we've had people from like Ghana and um, Russia. By the way, can you explain the popularity of the brand Ghana chocolate in Korea? I don't know. <laughs> does it have anything to do with Ghana? Maybe they get some of their beans from Ghana, but um, it's pro now it's probably like no relation. And honestly, it's not very good chocolate. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, you probably can't eat it. I would imagine no, it's it's it's, it's, it's uh, dairy. Do you do you ever? Are there things you miss about your time in Africa? Um, um I miss the food probably, and just kind of a laid back culture of Ghana. Um, the last time I went back was. I want to see 2008. I just went back for a very short while, and shit had changed a lot. Um, but yeah, I was like, man, it's so laid back, and just people are so friendly. Um, no one's going pali pali pali. And yeah, that's one of the things that I, I miss, and definitely the food, um, like the plantains oh, yes. and um, the beans, rice and beans, things like that. Yeah. There is a restaurant I will try soon that you've written about mm -hmm. on Aliens Day Out. It's uh, an Ethiopian restaurant in oh, Itaewon. Yeah. I hope it's still there. Um, because in Los Angeles, Ethiopian food is so big. Mm -hmm. Like, well, it's only two blocks, but there's many Ethiopian restaurants there, and it's like a thing you do, going eating Ethiopian food. And it's that's part of the blog that's that I, I think about. It's like your sort of explorations of soul. When did you start deliberately sort of venturing out and seeing what you could see in Seoul? Was it like a means of learning the city or of reintegrating yourself in Korea? Um, it was just more finding food to eat. Was in it Seoul. all about finding it food? It pretty much nice. was all about finding food. Um, uh, yeah, it was. I 
for as a vegan, I purposefully had to research where to eat, and and if I found a place that possibly had options, I would always go the distance to you know try it out. And once I started the blog, and it was kind of established as like the vegan resource in right. Korea, um, I felt you know the need to go and try out places and write a re- like my you know review of it and. Let people know that this place is, exists, and you know it's available for you. Right. Um, Don't let it go under. It's yeah, here. Exactly. Support it while you can. Um, so that was kind of the reason why I would go to all these random places in Seoul. But it was great, and that yeah, it, it it allowed me to get to know the city in a way that like like if I didn't have this purpose, yeah. then um, you need a driving sort of exactly. not obsession, but something close to it. Exactly, and I, I love doing that, like restaurant. You know, going to different restaurants and cafes too and um, definitely allows you to see and experience Seoul yeah what type of areas of Seoul did it take you to that you didn't expect to be in this this quest for food um oh so many different like small neighborhoods like um like Samcheongdong that area and Puamdong it's kind of like kind of hard to get to you need to cab it there or um even like like south of Gangnam and um yeah, just kind of all over. Even outside of Seoul, <laughs> there was one restaurant that it was like an hour and a half on some bus that I went to. But it was so worth the trip because, yes. yeah, sadly it closed though. <laughs> yes, I was I was speaking with uh, another guest listeners we'll hear on this program, Brian Myers, uh, mm-hmm. who's in Busan, which we've mentioned, your your birthplace and the, the, uh, the, sec- the second city, I guess you'd say. And it's fascinating how you think you can eat, you can eat vegan pretty well. I can tell from your blog in Seoul, it's possible. So I would think in the second largest city, it would still be reasonably possible. I guess it isn't possible almost at all, unless you eat at home all the time. Why does, why, why is there such a drop-off between Seoul and Busan in terms of what's available? Because like I, go to, I was at Busan the other day, obviously. I'll be there for a week a little bit later exploring, and it seems like it's a robust city like there's five million people there there's skyscrapers there's a beach the soul doesn't have a beach i mean there's all kinds of things but it's also like dismissed even by the people who live there like oh, nothing's going on here it's busan but it's such a contrast to like what i see around me there and if you took busan and dropped it down in america it'd be like a really exciting city probably <laughs> so what's why is it why is there such a difference between the city you were born in and the city that you live in now um Maybe it's because it's it's a, like a port city and it's all about the seafood in ah, Busan. First of all, um, like everywhere you go mm. is all about like that's fish true. and yeah. Mm. Um, so maybe that's a factor. Korean, uh, I know Busan people they love you know their raw fish and all that. Yeah. Um, and it's more. It is more. Even though it is a city, like I think the mentality of the people is definitely more more countryside like old school Koreans Um, and so yeah they're not really you know progressive in that Mm -hmm. sense and and there aren't as many foreigners in Busan as there are in in Seoul and there's definitely not that community in Busan I would say Um, unlike you know Seoul we kind of have like Itaewon that that is like this international community um, and that can foster that kind of thing. There's but, no Busan if they want. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure, but I think maybe those kind of play a part. Now, when you've been writing about Seoul, and ex- how much, first of all, I guess, I would imagine your exploration of Seoul has dropped off quite a bit since you've had to be at the, the uh, since you've had to be at the plant every, what, you're, you're there is it five days out of the six days? Um, I'm there six days. Uh, we're actually closed on Sunday and Monday. And Sunday is the one day that I'm actually away from the shop altogether. Right. So we're recording on a Sunday. Thing is closed. And then Mondays, the shop is closed. But I'm always there on Mondays because um, I have to bake for another cafe. And then baking for online deliveries, you know, that, you know orders that come in. So Monday is just kind of like a studio work day. Mm. And then the rest of the week is, yeah, shop is open. Now yeah. what, is, what are the most popular items today? What, what do people really you find there's been a big craving you've tapped into for? Um, since we reopened recently, um, I've been doing like a vegan grilled cheese chickpea melt sandwich, and that's been always like a huge hit. And then um, in terms of dessert, um, the chocolate cake with gingerbread cookie cream frosting, that's like really popular. 
And then I've been doing like gluten-free power balls. They'll sell out really well. Um, oh, and also I'm doing like a green smoothie, like a green power smoothie with like spirulina and bananas and it's a very peanut Californian butter. thing as well. Yeah, <laughs> and that's like now that it's summer, people are you know loving smoothies and yeah, things refreshing like that. So yeah, it's interesting that there's you have such a time-consuming business going on, but then also there's there's other elements of your life that you've documented. There's as, as I mentioned before, you're also an artist and you obviously are into travel and sort of experiencing the world. What sense do you have of how you can in the long term balance all these things in life? Is that an open question? I don't think there's any balance right now. Yes, at the moment, no. Yeah, at the moment, no. Um, In the future, I would love to be able to travel again and also just experience soul again. (laughs) Because, yeah, my world has become so small since opening the shop. Um, I'm pretty much at, you know, in Itaewon, like all the time. Um, but now that I'm gradually like finding workers to come join me and kind of, I'm hoping I can give them more responsibility in the future. And that, I mean, ideally I would be able to get to a point where plants can kind of run on its own and I don't have to be there all the time the way that I am now. Um, that's kind of like a dream. Um, I mean, obviously I don't want to just leave it, you know, I would, I, I still love working there. Um, and I do want to continue working there every day, but not like morning to night, you know. Yes. <laughs> um, and then I would, you know, I'm hoping to eventually be able to go on vacation every once in a while <laughs> and, sure. and enjoy those things too and kind of have a life outside of the mm-hmm. shop. Um, but I think that would take a while. Mm-hmm. We're still kind of in that, you know, growing period. So, yeah. And there seems to be a Korean phenomenon, especially among people in corporations. Like, the more successful they get, the more promoted they get. Not the more vacation they take, like, the less they take. It's, there's, have, you, have you noticed that thing where it's just people get more and more eminent and that means they actually have less freedoms in somehow? What, what's, what's going on with that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think they just they love working, too. Right, <laughs> yeah. that. I mean, when you're, when you're at the big shop six days a week, there is a certain, like, there's, there's got to be something satisfying as well in knowing, like, okay, I'm going to be here all day doing this. I know exactly what I'm going to be doing, right? Yeah, now that now I have this routine right. set out, and I know kind of what's going to, going to happen. I know what I have to do. And, um, yeah, I mean, there are not many surprises <laughs> during the week. Um, so once I do, like, really reach this um, steady routine, then I can gradually, like, kind of, you know... Now it's got to be, it's got to be hard when you're thinking about places you want to travel. When you get the ability, and there's people coming to you probably from a bunch of those places, right? You're sort of, yeah. you're getting, you're getting people who are representatives of the places you would go if only you could, right? Well, what end up being the places you think about wanting to go most often? Oh, out of the people who come, out of um, anything at all. I mean, when when you're thinking about like, oh, when I can travel next, uh, considering you've been uh-huh. how many places you've been, like given that. Where do you think about wanting to go next? I would love to go anywhere tropical. These days, it's like I just want to go somewhere tropical, like a beach. Like I'd love to go to Thailand. I've never been there before. And also Bali. I'm hearing great things about Bali these days. And um, yeah, just I want to go to the beach and eat like mangoes and like mm. fresh tropical fruit. <laughs> it's just someplace unlike Seoul. Yeah, Is that the idea? Exactly. Kind of mm. get away from right. everything. Yeah. Right. Tell me how how different has your experience of soul been in these years in these last eight years from what your ideas of soul had become when you had been away for so long growing up Mm -hmm. uh in my mind korea has become really hip now it's very um trendy um some things and that they're doing and uh yeah like cafe culture has become so big and um it's so much more modern than it was before and um, in terms of like technology especially uh, yeah it's pretty (laughs) impressive Mm. how far along it is what do you remember it being like before like when you were growing up when when you were here when I was in in high school well first of all I was in Taejeon which was even a smaller city than Seoul so I wasn't fully aware of everything that was going on but uh, I just remember it being very you know simple (laughs) kind Mm. of I mean uh, we didn't really have there was no like subway system in Taejeon and um, only like buses you know and I remember public transportation being so 
horrible. Wow. <laughs> just like so crowded and cramped and uncomfortable, and the traffic was insane. But now everything's yeah, just kind of like more smooth running, and people aren't so crazy. <laughs> mm. um, so, yeah. yeah. So it wasn't. It wasn't really necessarily cool to say you were from Korea when you were growing up. It, it is now, but then if you said I'm from Korea, like people in an international school, they didn't have any associations, did they? They just were like, were they like, where's that? Or were they just like, oh yeah, Korea, yeah. and then change the subject? <laughs> kind of, pretty much. Um, they have no interest, or they don't really know where Korea is, and then they're like, wait, South Korea or North Korea? They don't. <laughs> still, people who don't know about Korea, they always ask that, which as if you could have got out of the North. Exactly. Like if I was North Korean, would I even be here? You wouldn't, you wouldn't tell them, certainly. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, just. Yeah, they just didn't really understand what that meant. Like, what if I was like, oh, I'm from Korean or I'm Korean? Um, and I didn't honestly, I didn't really understand it either, just because I, I you know, lived so long in in Ghana and West Africa. I was still like kind of learning about what it means to be Korean. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I have. A, I feel like because your parents led the lives that they have, they didn't do the traditional Korean parent thing of like. Saying, oh, you want to run a, you want to run a vegan bake shop? Like, I feel like, say, you know, a Korean American parent would be like so harsh about that idea. They'd be like, just go, go back to school, go, go work somewhere. <laughs> they, they, I, I would take it your parents were not that way. No, actually, they've been so supportive. Um, I think initially when I became vegan, like before I started the shop or anything before, and then when I was turning vegan, you know, they, they were kind of like, why? They didn't really fully understand it, right. and they were like, why? I think they were just more concerned about my health. Just like, you know, make sure, are you being healthy? Is this like a healthy way to live, you know? Um, so that was their main concern, I think. But now seeing um, seeing that I'm, I'm like serious about this and this isn't just a phase in my life, um, being vegan. How least. long did that take before they were like, oh, she's actually vegan? Maybe like... Three, two, three years, maybe. Could be worse. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, now they're they they see it as like this is who I am and it's right. part of me and especially now that I have a shop there, I think they, yeah they're proud of you know what I'm doing and how successful it has become you know been so far at least and they see like how it is supported by so many people and that you know I should continue this and you know yeah they're very encouraging in that way. You've talked and written about some of the environmental reasons you initially wanted to become vegan. I wonder, this is going to sound like such an epic question, but do you think do you think the world will turn vegan at some point? Uh, Just because um, like this, you know, no, there's a lo- always more people, and technology is always getting better, but also, you know, the re- there's sort of the resource situation. Maybe, do you think it's maybe necessary at some point? I don't know if it's... 20 years in the future or 200 years in the future, but do you see that as some sort of inevitable endpoint? Um, I definitely think that it will become, there will be definitely more. It will just continue to grow. And um, I don't know about the world becoming fully vegan, like everybody becoming vegan. I don't even know if um, that would be a healthy thing um, really? for, for everybody to be vegan. But, so it's um, not all. It's not always healthy, or is it? It differs person to person, I think or it differs person to person. I mean, I think for the most part, if you can be mostly vegan, um, I think that's amazing. I don't, ex- I don't think, I don't expect it of everybody, though. I think just do the best you can. Um, but yeah, I mean, that would be amazing if everyone went vegan. Um, At that point, it wouldn't even be like going vegan. The word vegan wouldn't exist. Yeah, if everybody, exactly. if there would be no, no such thing as veganism. Yeah. It'd just be this is the food we have. Mm-hmm. Uh, in contrast to the food you know they ate in the old days, but I wonder because I feel like I mean I'm not vegan myself, but I have no real attachment to animal foods. I don't go around crate yeah. even if I eat meat, I don't really crave meat. And I feel like if I woke up tomorrow and the world was vegan, I would just sort of be like, "How about that?" Because because the problem with being vegan is how inconvenient it is <laughs> like it's not yeah. it, it's it's uh it's not about the food because the vegan food is always getting better but it's just like man i would i wouldn't want to have to check in advance <laughs> if i could eat in a place i mean with the korean social culture how do you how do you deal with that is it because you mostly do you mostly hang out with foreigners and that solves the problem or yeah, oh, pretty really? much um 
Yeah, honestly, I don't really have to deal with it as much, especially now that I have the shop. I'm, I just eat my own food all the time. Right. And even before that, I was always cooking for myself a lot, like more than other people. But um, yeah, like the social aspect of being vegan in Korea is definitely one of the hardest things, especially if you're working at like a bigger company and they have like the whole, you know, the kwesiks, like the, the d dining out as a company. Right. It's always at like a meat place, like a barbecue place. Yeah, <laughs> so it helps not to be working at Samsung or whatever. Yeah, maybe. But I just remember when I was working at a hagwon and we did have those like dinner outings, it was always at a barbecue place. And for me... I had to make that decision of whether I was going to go to that or, or like kind of stay away from it. Um, sometimes I would go, but then, you know, I would get like rice and just eat some of the, the side dishes. Um, I guess there are always the banchan. You can eat right. some. Can you, can you reliably eat many of those? A lot of them, yeah, like, like the green, like um, marinated spinach and all that. Um, and then, yeah, other times I would, you know, keep myself separate from that just because I felt uncomfortable being in that kind of setting um, so but then I didn't like the fact that I had to miss out on those kinds of social gatherings just because uh, you know I was vegan um, so that's just a, a decision that I had to make um, so you almost have to be in business yourself so you can have your own business culture that you're in right <laughs> maybe mm. yeah it does seem like a lot of what people eat and drink here is like their diet is just generally dictated by the social group. Like no one's really making a choice here. It seems like it's because it's not about, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like a lot of the time it's not about what do I want to eat, what do I want to drink. It's what is the group doing. That's what I'll do. They don't really, it's not about their preference necessarily. Is that true? Um, I think it depends what kind of group you're, you're with. Definitely with like companies it's kind of just decided for you um but with like friends i think there is more you know oh, let's go here or there but yeah i think it always depends what type of food then ends up being the the one you can have those social gatherings with where do you are you always eating somewhere in itaewon or what's what's the what, what is the korean barbecue of veganism um for me and my group of friends um we go to a lot of like thai restaurants because they have some vegan vegetarian options or like indian restaurants um you can always get like a good curry there um, even like some mexican places um like the whole mexican Mexican Korean fusion thing, which is really trending right now. So you can get like, you know, vegan burrito or, you know, guac and chips somewhere. Um, yeah. Mm. Those are pretty standard these days. And what sort of a perspective on Seoul does it give you being in a place like Itaewon? Because it's it seems like it's it's as we say, sort of separate but sort of central as well. I mean what what sense do you get of the city from that vantage point? How how different does it seem? when you were in Itaewon than if you were somewhere else entirely, you know, than if you were in Xinjiang or somewhere, I don't know. Um, I just love the diversity of Itaewon and I love that you can see so many different kinds of people walking around and whereas like, I mean, Korea, Seoul is becoming more, like there are definitely more foreigners now than there were years ago, um, but especially Itaewon, it's just amazing how you see so, people from all over the world in one place, and um, it's so different from anywhere else in Seoul, and just the vibes, and it's also, like, it's such a, it's weird because you would think the foreign community in Seoul is pretty big, but, like, it's amazing how small it actually is, and everyone kind of knows, everyone's connected somehow, yes. everyone knows someone who knows someone. It's not and many degrees apart, any exactly. of these people. Exactly, and um, like if you're just walking along you and it's so easy just to like run into a friend or someone you know, and um, that that kind of like community in Itaewon is like so rare outside of there. Yeah. Now, of course, the work of the shop keeps you busy, but how much of a chance do you get to talk to your customers and sort of get their stories of why they're in Seoul in the first place? That's, like, my favorite thing to do. I try to, like, yeah, get to know customers every day. So um, if you can't travel, you got to get the experience <laughs> that way. Yeah. Um, especially, yeah, I just, that's definitely one of the best things about having the shop is that I do get to meet so many people from, like, all over. And, um, I mean, if it's really busy, then I can't talk to people. But um, now that... 
I recently got like more part timers and helpers to work in the kitchen. I can like you know they can make the food and I can kind of like be host mm -hmm. and like do the front of the house. And so then I get to you know, interact with customers and see you know how they thought about the food and you know how long they've been in Korea and actually get to know them. And I have made so many great friends like through the shop and met so many amazing people. And yeah, this is like that's really the the best thing. And they they really are what keeps me going. Um, you know, there are days when you don't really want to yeah. be working. You Nobody know, wants to bake that. early in the morning every day. <laughs> exactly. Like, what am I doing in Korea? Why am I doing <laughs> this? <laughs> but then, Why aren't yeah. Why on a beach somewhere in yeah, Thailand? Exactly. Mm -hmm. But then when, like, people come in and, and what I, what I love is that, like, foreign, foreign customers are, are so appreciative of the, like, the vegan food and just plant in general. And they're so much more vocal about their appreciation. And I just, I, I'm so grateful, really. Um, what are some of the reasons foreigners are even in Korea in the first place? When you ask them, what do they tell you brought them, brought them here? A lot of them are just here trying to make some money, you know, pay off some school debt. Um, By uh, doing what? Teaching English, a lot of them, I would say a vast majority of them come to work at a hagwon or public school just teaching English and um, yeah, they, they come and um, you know, you don't really need a special degree to like be a teacher here, although it is getting a bit stricter now, but um, yeah, they come and they want to know the different kind of experience. Um, some people really, they come to Korea because they love Korea, like to begin with, and so they come and they're like, oh, you know, I want to live here, I learn Korean, and they really immerse themselves into it, while others are just kind of like here for the experience, like to make some money and then go back home. Yeah. It's one of the reasons I haven't gone to Itaewon yet, I think, because I'm afraid of being like, oh, of course, there's the white guy going to Itaewon <laughs> who doesn't, because he doesn't want to speak Korean or whatever. Like, I, I advise. Korean friends who come to Los Angeles, like, just live in a place that where there are a few Koreans. Or if you're coming to America, go live in, like, Indianapolis or something, because you'll learn, yeah. you'll learn English really quickly. So part of me is like, I do want to immerse myself in the most non-foreign areas. But, yeah, there's stuff that's not where, you know, plant and such are. Like, it's not, that's not where there's some amenities uh, that you want. But I wonder, as well as the travel thing, you know, do you do you also fantasize about what sort of art projects you can do when you have some more time? Oh yeah, all the time. Um, it's been so long since I drew or painted anything, just because, yeah, running plant has really taken over like everything. Was art the earliest pursuit for you? Yeah, it was. Like I, I went to college and studied graphic design and studio art. I was a studio art major, and I like. I always wanted to do like illustration, like freelance illustration and like editorial stuff. And that's when I came to Korea, that's kind of what I was hoping to pursue. Um, while I was doing the whole like English editing thing, I was also like painting, illustrating on the side. And I had like some like art shows here and there, random stuff. But um, I was never able to really break into the illustration scene or the art scene in Korea. And I wasn't very proactive about it either. And like the language barrier, like kind of held me back in a lot of ways. I felt, you know, I had the fear of, you know, like really pursuing it in Korea. Um, but, and then, you know, once I started baking and doing that, that kind of like gradually took over everything. I tried to like do both at the same time at one point, but after a while, I just kind of had to give up on that and kind of put it aside, and then maybe I'm one thing at a time. Yeah, exactly. Focus one thing on one thing at a time. But what sort of art forms do you think about plunging into when you do get the ability to do that? When you can put yourself at a bit more distance from the day to day at uh, the plant? Um, I don't really think about anything, doing anything too big. Mostly, just I just want to like do little illustrations and. Um, like make things like design calendars and and it's always something tied in with the shop these days like if i'm gonna if i'm gonna illustrate i want to you know make a t-shirt or something for plants or aliens day out or um i don't really think big scale anymore like i don't see myself doing like art shows or anything huge just you know. there is integration between them i mean yeah as you say t-shirts and i imagine the walls are a fairly good display space in them yeah, exactly um i i would love to hang more of my artwork on the wall there there are some things of mine in the shop kind of like hidden here and there um but yeah i would love to do more of that and yeah so when a vegan or a vegetarian comes to seoul and they've gone to plant what do you advise them to do next what do you have general 
strategies for existing in this city, even if it's not directly about what they're eating? I mean, what, what do you, when they ask you for advice, because I'm sure they do, what do you say to them? Uh, well, it mostly is like where to go to eat, <laughs> like restaurant advice, where to go. Um, if you're hungry, you've got, you can think of nothing else. You've got to eat. Then you can deal with everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I give them like a list of my favorite places to go and maybe like some farmer's markets they can hit up. And a lot of people will ask about, you know, where to find certain ingredients. And I'll tell them to go to like the foreign food mart or, you know, where to get kale. There's like a special sure, secret kale. on how to get kale in Korea. In California, there's very few places where you're not offered kale, exactly. I think, at, the, at this point. But it's not big here yet? No, no, no. There, I mean, there's... Um, you can get like flat leaf dinosaur kale um, pretty easily, but then in terms of like getting the curly lesento kale, it's harder. So, but there's one market across the street in Taiwan, like from plant, and it's like I have to order special from them. I get it in like a box, and so then I tell people, you know, go to them, order, you know, and then you can pick it up the next day. So, <laughs> would you advise them overall that it's probably easier than they think? Being vegan here in in Seoul or even indeed in general, but um, specifically here. Mm, I tell it's them it is a think. challenge. <laughs> I do. I do say you know, yeah, I understand it's really difficult, especially for foreigners because they don't know Korean. Um, but I I encourage them. I try to encourage them. Like you know, it gets easier because you know, for me, like the first year, two years was definitely was harder. Um, but like the more that you know where to go and like what to say it gets easier and um just start cooking more for yourself and um yeah it takes more planning but um but it'll improve your cooking skills and your language skills if you've got to find this stuff it's it's it makes it harder but it actually in some counterintuitive way makes it ultimately easier to be in korea yeah you'll learn so much in the process and you know learn more about yourself and like what you can take kind of <laughs> and what you're okay with giving up right, you're, you're <laughs> I've been speaking here in Gangnam with Mipa Lee. She is many things. She's an artist, she is the blogger behind Aliens Day Out, and she is the proprietor of Plant, the vegan and vegetarian bakery and cafe in Itaewon. Mipa, thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs> this has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to all the backers of Notebook on Cities and Culture's Korea tour on Kickstarter. Adam Hartzell, Aidan Nullman, Alfred Lee, Andy Cooney, Angus Gordon, Bala Chenupati, Cam Smith, Chin Music Press, Dan Caracelli, Danny, Deborah Smith, Emmett Ferriger, Umberto Grant, Ian Plosker, Ismail Kennessy, Jackie Gast, Jay Chang, Jeffrey Davis, James DeVito, Jonathan Filbert, Josh Paget, Kimberly Hahn, Manvir, Mark Hines, Matthew, Matthew Workman, Maureen Kincaid Speller, Monica Eck, Michael Fransky, MJ Pritchett, Patrick O'Flaherty, Patrick Park, Piers Rippey, Robert Salzberg, Samuel Hansen, Sean Brown, Themistocles Chacrusis, Thomas Unterberger, Timothy Dobbs, and Wayne Wright. <laughs>